The product appropriated by the capitalist is a use value, as yarn, for example, or boots. But although boots are, in one sense, the basis of all social progress, and our capitalist is a decided progressist, yet he does not manufacture boots for their own sake. Use value is, by no means, the thing conem polymem in the production of commodities. Use values are only produced by capitalists, because, and in so far as, they are the material substratum, the depositories of exchange value. Our capitalist has two objects in view. In the first place, he wants to produce a use value that has a value in exchange, that is to say, an article destined to be sold, a commodity. And secondly, he desires to produce a commodity whose value shall be greater than the sum of the values of the commodities used in its production, that is, of the means of production and the labor power that he purchased with his good money in the open market. His aim is to produce not only a used value, but a commodity also, not only a used value, but value, not only value, but at the same time, surplus value. It must be borne in mind that we are now dealing with the production of commodities, and that, up to this point, we have only considered one aspect of the process. Just as commodities are, at the same time, use values and values, so the process of producing them must be a labor process, and, at the same time, a process of creating value. Footnote as has been stated in a previous note, the English language has two different expressions for these two different aspects of labor. In the simple labor process, the process of producing use values, it is work. In the process of creation of value, it is labor, taking the term in its strictly economic sense. Frederick Engels End footnote Let us now examine production as a creation of value. We know that the value of each commodity is determined by the quantity of labor expended on and materialized in it, by the working time necessary, under given social conditions, for its production. This rule also holds good in the case of the product that accrued to our capitalist, as the result of the labor process carried on for him. Assuming this product to be ten pounds of yarn, our first step is to calculate the quantity of labor realized in it. For spinning the yarn, raw material is required. Suppose, in this case, 10 pounds of cotton. We have no need at present to investigate the value of this cotton, for our capitalist has, we will assume, bought it at its full value, say, of 10 shillings. In this price, the labor required for the production of the cotton is already expressed in terms of the average labor of society. We will further assume that the wear and tear of the spindle, which, for our present purpose, may represent all other instruments of labor employed, amounts to the value of twos. If, then, twenty-four hours labor, or two working days, are required to produce the quantity of gold represented by twelve shillings, we have here, to begin with, two days labor already incorporated in the yarn. We must not let ourselves be misled by the circumstance that the cotton has taken a new shape while the substance of the spindle has to a certain extent been used up. By the general law of value, if the value of 40 pounds of yarn equals the value of 40 pounds of cotton plus the value of a whole spindle, i.e., if the same working time is required to produce the commodities on either side of this equation, then ten pounds of yarn are an equal equivalent for ten pounds of cotton, together with one-fourth of a spindle. In the case we are considering, the same working time is materialized in the ten pounds of yarn on the one hand, and in the ten pounds of cotton and the fraction of a spindle on the other. Therefore, whether value appears in cotton in a spindle, or in yarn, makes no difference in the amount of that value. The spindle and cotton, instead of resting quietly side by side, 
join together in the process. Their forms are altered, and they are turned into yarn. But their value is no more affected by this fact than it would be if they had been simply exchanged for their equivalent in yarn. The labor required for the production of the cotton, the raw material of the yarn, is part of the labor necessary to produce the yarn, and is therefore contained in the yarn. The same applies to the labor embodied in the spindle, without whose wear and tear the cotton could not be spun. Hence, in determining the value of the yarn, or the labor time required for its production, all the special processes carried on at various times and in different places, which were necessary, first to produce the cotton and the wasted portion of the spindle, and then, with the cotton and spindle, to spin the yarn, may together be looked on as different and successive phases of one and the same process. The whole of the labor and the yarn is past labor. And it is a matter of no importance that the operations necessary for the production of its constituent elements were carried on at times which, referred to the present, are more remote than the final operation of spinning. If a definite quantity of labor, say thirty days, is requisite to build a house, the total amount of labor incorporated in it is not altered by the fact that the work of the last day is done twenty-nine days later than that of the first. Therefore, the labor contained in the raw material and the instruments of labor can be treated just as if it were labor expended in an earlier stage of the spinning process, before the labor of actual spinning commenced. The values of the means of production, i.e., the cotton and the needle, which values are expressed in the price of twelve shillings, are therefore constituent parts of the value of the yarn, or, in other words, of the value of the product. Two conditions must nevertheless be fulfilled. First, the cotton and spindle must concur in the production of a use value. They must, in the present case, become yarn. Value is independent of the particular use value by which it is born, but it must be embodied in a use value of some kind. Secondly, the time occupied in the labor of production must not exceed the time really necessary under the given social conditions of the case. Therefore, if no more than one pound of cotton be requisite to spin eleven pounds of yarn, care must be taken that no more than this weight of cotton is consumed in the production of eleven pounds of yarn, and similarly with regard to the spindle. Though the capitalist have a hobby, and use a gold instead of a steel spindle, yet the only labor that counts for anything in the value of the yarn is that which would be required to produce a steel spindle, because no more is necessary under the given social conditions. We now know what portion of the value of the yarn is owing to the cotton and the spindle. It amounts to twelve shillings, or the value of two days' work. The next point for our consideration is, what portion of the value of the yarn is added to the cotton by the labor of the spinner? We have now to consider this labor under a very different aspect from that which it had during the labor process. There, we viewed it solely as that particular kind of human activity which changes cotton into yarn. There, the more the labor was suited to the work, the better the yarn other circumstances remaining the same. The labor of the spinner was then viewed as specifically different from other kinds of productive labor. Different on the one hand in its special aim, viz. spinning. Different, on the other hand, in the special character of its operations, in the special nature of its means of production, and in the special use value of its product. For the operation of spinning, cotton, and spindles are a necessity, but for making rifled cannon, they would be of no use whatever. Here, on the contrary, where we consider the labor of the spinner only so far as it is value-creating, i.e., a source of value, his labor differs in no respect 
from the labor of the cotton planter and spindle maker incorporated in the means of production. It is solely by reason of this identity that cotton planting, spindle making, and spinning are capable of forming the component parts differing only quantitatively from each other, of one whole, namely, the value of the yarn. Here, we have nothing more to do with the quality, the nature, and the specific character of the labor, but merely with its quantity. And this simply requires to be calculated. We proceed upon the assumption that spinning is simple, unskilled labor, the average labor of a given state of society. Hereafter, we shall see that the contrary assumption would make no difference. While the laborer is at work, his labor constantly undergoes a transformation. From being motion, it becomes an object without motion. From being the laborer working, it becomes the thing produced. At the end of one hour's spinning, that act is represented by a definite quantity of yarn. In other words, a definite quantity of labor, namely that of one hour, has become embodied in the cotton. We say labor, i.e., the expenditure of his vital force by the spinner, and not spinning labor, because the special work of spinning counts here only so far as it is the expenditure of labor power in general, and not in so far as it is the specific work of the spinner. In the process we are now considering, it is of extreme importance that no more time be consumed in the work of transforming the cotton into yarn than is necessary under the given social conditions. If under normal, i.e., average social conditions of production, A pounds of cotton ought to be made into B pounds of yarn by one hour's labor, then a day's labor does not count as twelve hours' labor unless twelve A pounds of cotton have been made into twelve B pounds of yarn. For in the creation of value, the time that is socially necessary alone counts. Not only the labor, but also the raw material and the product now appear in quite a new light, very different from that in which we viewed them in the labor process, pure and simple. The raw material serves now merely as an absorbent of a definite quantity of labor. By this absorption, it is in fact changed into yarn, because it is spun, because labor power in the form of spinning is added to it. But the product the yarn is now nothing more than a measure of the labor absorbed by the cotton. If in one hour, one and two-thirds pounds of cotton can be spun into one and two-thirds pounds of yarn, then ten pounds of yarn indicate the absorption of six hours' labor. Definite quantities of product, these quantities being determined by experience, now represent nothing but definite quantities of labor definite masses of crystallized labor time. They are nothing more than the materialization of so many hours or so many days of social labor. We are here no more concerned about the facts that the labor is the specific work of spinning than its subject is cotton and its product yarn, than we are about the fact that the subject itself is already a product and therefore raw material. If the spinner instead of spinning, were working in a coal mine, the subject of his labor, the coal, would be supplied by nature. Nevertheless, a definite quantity of extracted coal, a hundredweight for example, would represent a definite quantity of absorbed labor. We assume on the occasion of its sale that the value of a day's labor power is three shillings, and that six hours' labor is incorporated in that sum and consequently, that this amount of labor is requisite to produce the necessaries of life daily required on an average by the laborer. If now our spinner, by working for one hour, can convert one and two-third pounds of cotton into one and two-third pounds of yarn, it follows that in six hours he will convert ten pounds of cotton into ten pounds of yarn. Footnote. These figures are quite arbitrary. And footnote. Hence, during the spinning process, the cotton absorbs six hours of labor. The same quantity of labor is also embodied 
in a piece of gold of the value of three shillings. Consequently, by mere labor of spinning, a value of three shillings is added to the cotton. Let us now consider the total value of the product, the ten pounds of yarn. Two and a half days' labor has been embodied in it, of which two days were contained in the cotton and in the substance of the spindle worn away, and half a day was absorbed during the process of spinning. These two and a half days' labor is also represented by a piece of gold of the value of fifteen shillings. Hence, fifteen shillings is an adequate price for the ten pounds of yarn, or the price of one pound is eighteen pence. Our capitalist stares in astonishment. The value of the product is exactly equal to the value of the capital advanced. The value so advanced has not expanded. No surplus value has been created and consequently, money has not been converted into capital. The price of the yarn is fifteen shillings, and fifteen shillings were spent in the open market upon the constituent elements of the product, or, what amounts to the same thing, upon the factors of the labor process. Ten shillings were paid for the cotton, two shillings for the substance of the spindle worn away, and three shillings for the labor power. The swollen value of the yarn is of no avail, for it is merely the sum of the values formerly existing in the cotton, the spindle, and the labor power. Out of such a simple addition of existing values, no surplus value can possibly arise. Footnote. This is the fundamental proposition on which is based the doctrine of the physiocrats as to the unproductiveness of all labor that is not agriculture. It is irrefutable for the orthodox economist. Cette façon d'un peuture a une seule chose, le valeur de plaisir zout, par exemple à Oulon, la consommation du tissant, d'y appliquer pour ainsi dire, couche sur couche, plaisir valeur sur un seul, fait que celle-ci goïsse du temps. Les termes d'édition pentriban, la minière dans ce fond, Le prix du vage demande d'oeuvre, si prix ne compte total, des plaisirs valeurs qu'on se mise et additionné s'ensemble, or additionné n'est pas multiplié. This method of adding to one particular object the value of a number of others, for example, adding the living costs of the weaver to the flax, of, as it were, heaping up various values in layers on top of one single value, has the result that this value grows to the same extent. The expression addition gives a very clear picture of the way in which the price of a manufactured product is formed. This price is only the sum of a number of values which have been consumed, and it is arrived at by adding them together. However, addition is not the same as multiplication. Merci de la Rivière. L.C., page 599. And footnote. These separate values are now all concentrated in one thing, but so they were also in the sum of fifteen shillings, before it was split up into three parts, by the purchase of the commodities. There is in reality nothing very strange in this result. The value of one pound of yarn being eighteen pence, if our capitalist buys ten pounds of yarn in the market, he must pay fifteen shillings for them. It is clear that, whether a man buys his house ready-built, or gets it built for him, in neither case will the mode of acquisition increase the amount of money laid out on the house. Our capitalist, who is at home in his vulgar economy, exclaims, Oh, but I advance my money for the express purpose of making more money. The way to hell is paved with good intentions, and he might just as easily have intended to make money without producing at all. Footnote. Thus, from 1844 to 47, he withdrew part of his capital from productive employment in order to throw it away in railway speculations. And so also, during the American Civil War, he closed his factory and turned his workpeople into the streets in order to gamble on the Liverpool Cotton Exchange. End footnote. He threatens all sorts of things. 
he won't be caught napping again. In future, he will buy the commodities in the market instead of manufacturing them himself. But if all his brother capitalists were to do the same, where would he find his commodities in the market? And his money cannot eat. He tries persuasion. Consider my abstinence. I might have played ducks and drakes with the fifteen shillings, but instead of that, I consumed it productively, and made yarn with it. Very well, and by way of reward he is now in possession of good yarn instead of a bad conscience, and as for playing the part of a miser, it would never do for him to relapse into such bad ways as that. We have seen before to what results such asceticism leads. Besides, where nothing is, the king has lost his rights. Whatever may be the merit of his abstinence, there is nothing wherewith specially to remunerate it, because the value of the product is merely the sum of the values of the commodities that were thrown into the process of production. Let him therefore console himself with the reflection that virtue is its own reward. But no, he becomes importunate. He says, The yarn is of no use to me. I produced it for sale. In that case let him sell it, or... Still better, let him for the future produce only things for satisfying his personal wants, a remedy that his physician, McCulloch, has already prescribed as infallible against an epidemic of overproduction. He now gets obstinate. Can the laborer, he asks, merely with his arms and legs produce commodities out of nothing? Did I not supply him with the materials by means of which, and in which alone, his labor could be embodied? And as the greater part of society consists of such ne'er-do-wells, have I not rendered society incalculable service by my instruments of production, my cotton, and my spindle, and not only society, but the laborer also, whom in addition I have provided with the necessaries of life? And am I to be allowed nothing in return for all this service? Well, but has not the laborer rendered him the equivalent service of changing his cotton and spindle into yarn? Moreover, there is here no question of service. Footnote. Extol thyself, put on finery and adorn thyself. But whoever takes more or better than he gives, that is usury, and is not service, but wrong done to his neighbor, as when one steals and robs. All is not service and benefit to a neighbor that is called service and benefit. For an adulteress and an adulterer do one another great service and pleasure. A horseman does an incendiary a great service by helping him to rob on the highway, and pillage land and houses. The papists do ours a great service, and that they don't drown, burn, murder all of them, or let them all rot in prison, but let some live, and only drive them out or take from them what they have. The devil himself does his servants inestimable service. To sum up, the world is full of great, excellent, and daily service and benefit. Martin Luther, Andy Faren, Wiederden, Wuher zu Reding, Wittenberg, 1540. End footnote. A service is nothing more than the useful effect of a use value be it of a commodity, or be it of labor. Footnote In Zur Kritik der Paul Oeck Page 14 I make the following remark on this point. It is not difficult to understand what service, the category service, must render to a class of economists like J. B. Say and F. Bastia. End footnote but here we are dealing with exchange value. The capitalist paid to the laborer a value of three shillings, and the laborer gave back to him an exact equivalent in the value of three shillings, added by him to the cotton. He gave him value for value. Our friend, up to this time so purse-proud, suddenly assumes the modest demeanor of his own workman, and exclaims, Have I myself not worked? Have I not performed the labor of superintendence and of overlooking the spinner? And does not this labor too, 
create value? His overlooker and his manager try to hide their smiles. Meanwhile, after a hearty laugh, he reassumes his usual mien. Though he chanted to us the whole creed of the economists, in reality, he says, he would not give a brass farthing for it. He leaves this and all such like subterfuges and juggling tricks to the professors of political economy, who are paid for it. He himself is a practical man, and though he does not always consider what he says outside his business, yet in his business he knows what he is about. Let us examine the matter more closely. The value of a day's labor power amounts to three shillings, because on our assumption half a day's labor is embodied in that quantity of labor power, i.e., because the means of subsistence that are daily required for the production of labor power cost half a day's labor. But the past labor that is embodied in the labor power, and the living labor that it can call into action, the daily cost of maintaining it, and its daily expenditure and work, are two totally different things. The former determines the exchange value of the labor power. The latter is its use value. The fact that half a day's labor is necessary to keep the laborer alive during twenty-four hours does not in any way prevent him from working a whole day. Therefore, the value of labor power and the value which that labor power creates in the labor process are two entirely different magnitudes. And this difference of the two values was what the capitalist had in view when he was purchasing the labor power. The useful qualities that labor power possesses, and by virtue of which makes it yarn or boots, were to him nothing more than a condidio sine qua non, for in order to create value, labor must be expended in a useful manner. What really influenced him was the specific use value which this commodity possesses of being a source not only of value, but of more value than it has itself. This is the special service that the capitalist expects from labor power, and in this transaction he acts in accordance with the eternal laws of the exchange of commodities. The seller of labor power, like the seller of any other commodity, realizes its exchange value and parts with its use value. He cannot take one without giving the other. The use value of labor power, or in other words, labor, belongs just as little to its seller as the use value of oil, after it has been sold, belongs to the dealer who has sold it. The owner of the money has paid the value of a day's labor power. His, therefore, is the use of it for a day. A day's labor belongs to him. The circumstance that on the one hand the daily sustenance of labor power costs only a half day's labor, while on the other hand the very same labor power can work during a whole day, that consequently the value which its use during one day creates is double what he pays for that use, this circumstance is, without doubt, a piece of good luck for the buyer, but by no means an injury to the seller. Our capitalist foresaw this state of things, and that was the cause of his laughter. The laborer therefore finds, in the workshop, the means of production necessary for working, not only during six, but during twelve hours. Just as during the six hours process our ten pounds of cotton absorbed six hours labor and became ten pounds of yarn, so now twenty pounds of cotton will absorb twelve hours labor and be changed into twenty pounds of yarn. Let us now examine the product of this prolonged process. There is now materialized in this twenty pounds of yarn the labor of five days, of which four days are due to the cotton and the lost steel of the spindle the remaining day having been absorbed by the cotton during the spinning process. Expressed in gold, the labor of five days is thirty shillings. This is therefore the price of twenty pounds of yarn, giving, as before, eighteen pence as the price of a pound. But the sum of the values of the commodities that entered into the process amounts to twenty-seven shillings. The value of the yarn is thirty shillings. 
Therefore, the value of the product is one-ninth greater than the value advanced for its production. Twenty-seven shillings have been transformed into thirty shillings. A surplus value of three shillings has been created. The trick has at last succeeded. Money has been converted into capital. Every condition of the problem is satisfied, while the laws that regulate the exchange of commodities have been in no way violated. Equivalent has been exchanged for equivalent. For the capitalist is buyer paid for each commodity, for the cotton, the spindle, and the labor power, its full value. He then did what is done by every purchaser of commodities. He consumed their use value. The consumption of the labor power, which was also the process of producing commodities, resulted in 20 pounds of yarn having a value of 30 shillings. The capitalist, formerly a buyer, now returns to the market as a seller of commodities. He sells his yarn at 18 pence a pound, which is its exact value. Yet, for all that, he withdraws three shillings more from circulation than he originally threw into it. This metamorphosis, this conversion of money into capital, takes place both within the sphere of circulation and also outside it. Within the circulation, because conditioned by the purchase of the labor power in the market, outside the circulation, because what is done within it is only a stepping stone to the production of surplus value, a process which is entirely confined to the sphere of production. Thus, everything is for the best and the best of all possible worlds. Voltaire Candide. By turning his money into commodities that serve as the material elements of a new product, and as factors in the labor process, by incorporating living labor with their dead substance, the capitalist at the same time converts value, i.e., past, materialized, and dead labor into capital, into value, big with value, a live monster that is fruitful and multiplies. If we now compare the two processes of producing value and of creating surplus value, we see that the latter is nothing but the continuation of the former beyond a definite point. If on the one hand, the process be not carried beyond the point where the value paid by the capitalist for the labor power is replaced by an exact equivalent, it is simply a process of producing value. If on the other hand, it be continued beyond that point, it becomes a process of creating surplus value. If we proceed further, and compare the process of producing value with the labor process, pure and simple, we find that the latter consists of the useful labor, the work that produces use values. Here we contemplate the labor as producing a particular article. We view it under its quantitative aspect alone, with regard to its end and aim. But viewed as a value-creating process, the same labor process presents itself under its quantitative aspect alone. Here it is a question merely of the time occupied by the laborer in doing the work, of the period during which the labor power is usefully expended. Here, the commodities that take part in the process do not count any longer as necessary adjuncts of labor power in the production of a definite, useful object. They count merely as depositories of so much absorbed or materialized labor. That labor, whether previously embodied in the means of production, or incorporated in them for the first time during the process by the action of labor power, counts in either case only according to its duration. It amounts to so many hours or days as the case may be. Moreover, only so much of the time spent in the production of any article is counted as under the given social conditions, is necessary. The consequences of this are various. In the first place, it becomes necessary that the labor should be carried on under normal conditions. If a self-acting mule is the implement in general use for spinning, it would be absurd to supply the spinner with a distaff and spinning wheel. The cotton, too, must not be such rubbish as to cause extra waste in being worked but must be of suitable quality. Otherwise, the spinner would be found to spend more time in producing a pound of yarn than is socially necessary, in which case the excess of time would create neither value nor money. 
but whether the material factors of the process are of normal quality or not depends not upon the laborer, but entirely upon the capitalist. Then again, the labor power itself must be of average efficacy. In the trade in which it is being employed, it must possess the average skill, hardiness, and quickness prevalent in that trade. And our capitalist took good care to buy labor power of such normal goodness. This power must be applied with the average amount of exertion and with the usual degree of intensity. And the capitalist is as careful to see that this is done as that his workmen are not idle for a single moment. He has bought the use of the labor power for a definite period, and he insists upon his rights. He has no intention of being robbed. Lastly, and for this purpose, our friend has a penal code of his own. All wasteful consumption of raw material or instruments of labor is strictly forbidden, because what is so wasted represents labor superfluously expended, labor that does not count in the product or enter into its value. Footnote. This is one of the circumstances that makes production by slave labor such a costly process. The laborer here is, to use a striking expression of the ancients, distinguishable only as instrumentum vocal, from an animal as instrumentum semi-vocal, and from an implement as instrumentum mutum. But he himself takes care to let both beast and implement feel that he is none of them, but is a man. He convinces himself with immense satisfaction that he is a different being, by treating the one unmercifully and damaging the other con amori. Hence, the principle, universally applied in this method of production, only to employ the rudest and heaviest implements, and such, as are difficult to damage, owing to their sheer clumsiness. In the slave states, bordering on the Gulf of Mexico, down to the date of the Civil War, plows constructed on old Chinese models, which turned up the soil like a hog or a mole, instead of making furrows, were alone to be found. Conf. J. E. Cairns, The Slave Power, London, 1862, page 46, SQQ. In his Seaboard Slave States, Olmsted tells us, I am here shown tools that no man in his senses, with us, would allow a laborer for whom he was paying wages to be encumbered with and the excessive weight and clumsiness of which, I would judge, would make work at least ten percent greater than with those ordinarily used with us, and I am assured that, in the careless and clumsy way they must be used by the slaves, anything lighter or less rude could not be furnished them with good economy, and that such tools as we constantly give our laborers, and find our profit in giving them, would not last out a day in a Virginia cornfield much lighter and more free from stones, though it be, than ours. So, too, when I ask why mules are so universally substituted for horses on the farm, the first reason given, and confessedly the most conclusive one, is that horses cannot bear the treatment that they always must get from negroes. Horses are always soon foundered or crippled by them, while mules will bear cudgeling, or lose a meal or two now and then, and not be materially injured, and they do not take cold or get sick, if neglected or overworked. But I do not need to go further than to the window of the room in which I am writing, to see at almost any time, treatment of cattle that would ensure the immediate discharge of the driver by almost any farmer owning them in the north. End footnote. We now see that the difference between labor considered on the one hand as producing utilities, and on the other hand as creating value, a difference which we discovered by our analysis of a commodity, resolves itself into a distinction between two aspects of the process of production. The process of production, considered on the one hand as the unity of the labor process and the process of creating value, is production of commodities. Considered on the other hand, as the unity of the labor process and the process of producing surplus value, 
it is the capitalist process of production, or capitalist production of commodities. We stated, on a previous page, that in the creation of surplus value, it does not in the least matter whether the labor appropriated by the capitalist be simple unskilled labor of average quality or more complicated skilled labor. All labor of higher or more complicated character than average labor is expenditure of labor power of a more costly kind. Labor power whose production has cost more time and labor and which therefore has a higher value than unskilled or simple labor power. This power being higher value, its consumption is labor of a higher class. Labor that creates in equal times proportionately higher values than unskilled labor does. Whatever difference in skill there may be between the labor of a spinner and that of a jeweler, the portion of his labor by which the jeweler merely replaces the value of his own labor power does not in any way differ in the quantity from the additional portion by which he creates surplus value. In the making of jewelry, just as in spinning, the surplus value rests only from a quantitative excess of labor, from a lengthening out of one and the same labor process. In the one case, of the process of making jewels, and the other, of the process of making yarn. Footnote. The distinction between skilled and unskilled labor rests in part on pure illusion, or, to say the least, on distinctions that have long since ceased to be real, and that survive only by virtue of a traditional convention, in part on the helpless condition of some groups of the working class, a condition that prevents them from exacting equally with the rest of the value of their labor power. Accidental circumstances here play so great a part that these two forms of labor sometimes change places. Where, for instance, the physique of the working class has deteriorated and is, relatively speaking, exhausted, which in the case in all countries with a well-developed capitalist production, the lower forms of labor, which demand great expenditure of muscle, are in general considered as skilled, compared with much more delicate forms of labor. Take as an example the labor of a bricklayer, which in England occupies a much higher level than that of a damask weaver. Again, although the labor of a fustian cutter demands great bodily exertion, and is at the same time unhealthy, yet it counts only as unskilled labor. And then, we must not forget that the so-called skilled labor does not occupy a large space in the field of national labor. Lang estimates that in England and Wales, the livelihood of 11,300,000 people depends on unskilled labor. If from the total population of 18 million living at the time when he wrote, we deduct a million for the genteel population, and 1,500,000 for paupers, vagrants, criminals, prostitutes, etc., and 4,650,000 who compose the middle class, there remain the above a mentioned 11 million. But in his middle class he includes people that live on the interest of small investments, officials, men of letters, artists, schoolmasters, and the like, and in order to swell the number he also includes in these 4,650,000 the better paid portion of the factory operatives. The bricklayers too figure amongst them. S. Lang, National Distress, etc. London, 1844. The great class who have nothing to give for food but ordinary labor are the great bulk of the people. James Mill, in article Colony, Supplement to the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1831. End footnote. But on the other hand, in every process of creating value, the reduction of skilled labor to average social labor, e.g., one day of skilled to six days of unskilled labor, is unavoidable. Footnote. Where reference is made to labor as a measure of value, it necessarily implies labor of one particular kind, the proportion which the other kinds bear to it being easily ascertained. Outlines of Political Economy 
London, 1832. Printed pages 22 and 23. And footnote. We therefore save ourselves a superfluous operation and simplify our analysis by the assumption that the labor of the workman employed by the capitalist is unskilled average labor. End part three. The production of absolute surplus value. Chapter seven. The labor process and the process of producing surplus value. Section two. The production of surplus value.